Hey, this morning, again, we are talking about more than conquerors. I hope that you are growing in that and getting some little tips and ideas on continuing to be more than a conqueror. Again, our theme verse is Romans 8, 37. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Again, Paul is saying that you are not a victim. You are, through Christ, an over-above victor. You are a super-victor. You are an overwhelmingly conqueror. Not just getting by, but because of Christ, you are a victor. Um, we've talked about the name of Jesus. We've talked about the blood of Jesus, the armor of God, uh, the love of God. We've talked about submitting to God last week. And this morning, I want to talk about the power of praise. Now, that could be a series in itself, prayer, praise and worship. There's a lot to go into that, so we're just going to touch on some of that as it relates to some of the battles that we face. Satan and his demons absolutely hate it every time they see Christians worshiping and praising the Lord. They hate it. Two scripture passages that describe Satan before he fell are in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Satan was an anointed cherub. He was adorned with every precious jewel imaginable. He was the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, according to verse 12 of Ezekiel 28. Likely he was the highest of all the angels. He was persuasive enough to be able to convince one-third of the angels to join him in his rebellion. And even after his fall from heaven, not even Michael the archangel dared to stand up to him without the Lord's help in Jude number, verse 9. Satan fell because of his pride. He did not like being second best. He wanted to be God, in fact. In fact, Isaiah 14, 13 says, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. Satan wanted all of that kind of worship for himself when he was up in heaven. And every time he sees one of us worshiping the Lord, it is a constant reminder of his defeat and of his expulsion out of heaven. Now, most think of praise and worship as a spiritual song that is sung and or played with an instrument. In fact, we often interchange the words praise and, and worship. We might say, hey, let's worship the Lord. Let's praise the Lord and be thinking and saying the same thing. I often say, you've probably heard me say this, is that worship is anything that you do that puts a smile on God's face. Anything that you do that pleases God, that makes him happy, that is an act of worship to the Lord. So it's not just, worship isn't just about singing and playing an instrument. Because some of you feel inadequate because you don't have a voice and you don't play anything. So you're like, I can't worship. No, everything you do that puts a smile on his face is an act of worship to the Lord. Now, praise comes from a Latin word that means value or price. So to give praise to God is to proclaim his merit and to proclaim his worth. Many terms are used to express this in the Bible, including glory or blessing, thanksgiving, and hallelujah, which is a transliteration of the Hebrew for praise the Lord. Hopefully now you know, if you ever hear someone saying hallelujah, it simply means praise the Lord. The modes of praise are many. In the Old Testament, they have the idea of offering a sacrifice. Uh, there's physical movement, there's silence and meditation, there's testimony, there's prayer, uh, there's just living a holy life is praise to the Lord. Uh, our praise is almost always linked to music, to instruments, to especially to the voice. Uh, there's biblical song, songs of praise that are ranged from very personal, uh, more or less kind of spontaneous songs that the person just bursts forth in singing because of or based on what God has just done. Um, I'm not a songwriter, but I'll often do that. I'll just, something God's doing, I'll just start singing. And he'll just start giving me the words. Sometimes they rhyme and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they sound a little, oh, that wasn't very good. And sometimes they're like, wow, I should remember that. It was really good. But I just, you just burst forth in song and spontaneous. 
And, and yet sometimes there are people that are gifted to be able to hear from God and write down these words and put them to music, and then corporately we're able to come together and sing these songs. And it's, it's endless. I mean, we live in a day and age where songs are just being poured into people's hearts over and over again, and with technology, they're being distributed almost instantaneously. Years ago, again, we would have a songbook that a church would have for 40 years, and it never changed. And that's what the songs we had, and we got familiar with those, and, and really, are, they're very near and dear to many of our hearts, but the songs are just flooding out there so fast, there's no way we could even keep up with it. Because people are praising and worshiping the Lord and have the, uh, the, uh, the ability to communicate that very, very quickly. While the Bible calls on people to praise God, there's also occasional warnings about the quality of this praise. You see, praise is to originate in the heart and not to become an outward thing of show. And I love our worship team because when they're up here, they're never up here to show. They just enter in and they begin to praise the Lord and they're hoping that you're just going to join along with them. And that's just what they're doing up here. They're just, hey, we're going to praise God. You want to join us? That would be awesome. Praise the joyful recounting of all that God has done. And it's closely intertwined to thanksgiving. And so every day we ought to praise the Lord. And the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How many of you are breathing this morning? Raise your hand. If you are breathing right now, some of you are... Call 911, please. There's a whole group that's not raising their hand. We need to start some mouth-to-mouth. Well, maybe not that, but you start some compression. Maybe you don't even do mouth-to-mouth anymore. It's just the compression thing. But how many of you are breathing this morning? Raise your hand. Some of you still just are not going to do that, are you? Well, the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, worship, however, comes from a different place within our spirits. Worship should be reserved for God alone. Uh, Praise can be a part of worship, but worship goes beyond praise. Praise can be very easy, while worship sometimes is not. See, worship gets to the heart of, of who we are, ourselves before God, surrendering every part of our lives to his control, adoring him for who he is, not just for what he has done. Worship is a lifestyle, not just an occasional activity. And Jesus said the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, there's some great stories in the Bible about praise and worship. I want to just cover a couple of them. Uh, One is found in the Old Testament. Now, God has been fighting battles for people for thousands of years. And in the book of Kings, There's a king named Jehoshaphat that had God come into a situation and fight a battle for him. So he was the fourth king of the southern kingdom, Judah. His name means Jehovah Judges. He was the son of a godly king named King Asa. And Asa died and Jehoshaphat was about 35 years of age when he then ascended to his father's throne. He reigned for 25 years, and in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 9, it describes his character as one who sought the Lord with all his heart. Now, early in his reign, we see that his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Now, he sent men throughout Judah to teach God's word, and as a result of his efforts, the fear of the Lord fell upon the nations of Judah, and there was a great peace that settled in the land. And God was blessing everything that Jehoshaphat was doing. Chapter 18 describes, however, Jehoshaphat's downfall. In verse 1, it tells us that he joined up with Ahab. Ahab was the the, the, uh, despicable king of Israel who was married to Jezebel. Many of you have heard that name before, Jezebel. He was an idolater who hated the one true God. And Jehoshaphat married This man's daughter, and through this relationship, Jehoshaphat was led astray. Later on, Jehoshaphat then repented, though, uh, and, and didn't trust Ahab anymore, and went back to seeking the Lord. Now, after a period of peace and spiritual renewal, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Syrians, and others mounted up this major assault against Jerusalem. And verse three says plainly, Jehoshaphat feared. So he went from a great place of peace in the land 
to suddenly, after his rebellion, even though he's coming back to God, still there's a place where the, the armies are coming against and he feared. You know, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. But this time he knew he couldn't defeat his enemies on his own. But this time he wasn't seeking an alliance with man. The Bible says he set himself to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout all of Judah. The people of the kingdom gathered together and they began to ask help from the Lord. And they came from all the cities of Judah. They began to seek the Lord. You know, there's nothing better when you are in trouble uh, to gather around some fellow believers, some friends, and to begin to pray, begin to seek the Lord together and worship God. You see, and too many times we end up having uh, going to God and praying or going to God and worship and praise as the last thing we're going to do when we're faced with a problem, rather than that being the go-to. When you have a problem, when things aren't working, begin to praise the Lord. There's a lot of days that I don't feel like it, and things are stinking, and they're not going the way I thought they would go, and I'm just like, man, I'm just in a funk today. It's just, ah. And like, you know what you ought to do? You ought to praise the Lord and worship the Lord. I know I need to do it. I, oh, I just don't feel like it today. And if I can just get myself beyond the feelings and begin to worship the Lord and just begin to lift my voice, it's amazing what happens in my spirit, what happens in my attitude, in my thinking. It totally begins to change. And this is what this, these people are doing. They're calling on God. They're seeking God. And God begins to move in their midst. The nation humbled themselves before God. In front of the nation, King Jehoshaphat prayed and praised God for who he is, for what he has done, and what he knew he could do. Praise God for those things, for what he's done for what he's doing and for what you know he can do. Now, the king's praise becomes a specific request. In essence, he's saying, God, we are absolutely dependent on you. There is no way I can win this battle. Without you, we are dead. And earlier, Joseph had depended on this evil Ahab, and now he's learned his lesson. And now he's in total dependence on God. And while they're together, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Jehaziel, and he stood up in the assembly, and he gives these words, and I'm going to read a lengthier passage, Second Chronicles 20, 15. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. We could do a drop mic right there, couldn't we? Boom, it's over. The battle is not yours. It is God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. He's probably thinking, what? How are, how are we not going to fight the battle? He says, take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. I want you even right now to apply that to what you're going through. Are you discouraged? Are you facing a battle? Are you struggling today? Apply this word to your situation today. And look at what he does. In verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. And some Levites from Kohathites and Korahites, stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me. Judah and people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord. Nothing against women, but men, we need you to rise up and sing to the Lord. We need you men to lead the way. 
and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now again, pause there for a moment. Where did the worshipers go? Who were they ahead of? The army. How many to you, that, that, does that seem a little backwards? <laughs> all right, they're just, they've been wrestling with fear. All right, fear has gripped them. Now they have armies coming against them. And now he's, he leads them out. He tells them to go out and the worshipers go first. You would think that he is just adding to the fear. Wait a minute. Shouldn't those with weapons go ahead? I mean, we'll just sneak in between them just like they did in Jericho, right? In Jericho, those that fought were in front and behind, and those playing the trumpets were in the middle. But here he's like, I want the worshipers to go first, and the army's going to follow. Whoa, that's different. How many of you have been in the military? Raise your hand. Thank you for serving. Thank you for serving. How many of you have ever gone into battle and you had worshipers go before you? I'm not seeing any hands, although I'm, I bet privately many of you were worshiping the Lord and calling on the name of the Lord at that time. This is unique. This is different. It's never been done this way before. Verse 22, as they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. They started fighting against their allies. In fact, they were supposed to be on the team, same team and they're killing each other. After they had finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So they turned on their allies and then they start turning on each other like utter total confusion going on here. Now verse 24, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. I wonder if my daughter will be seeing this any day soon. This place, she's in Israel right now. Like, oh, to be able to see the actual place that these things happened. But praise brings God on the scene, friends. In Psalm, there's a verse that says, God inhabits the praises of his people. When you're going through a hard time, the last thing you feel like doing is praising. But it is the most important thing. And to enter into that time of worship, it shows faith, it shows trust. Even more than that, God loves praise. God loves worship. And he is free to come in and begin to work in your situation that you are facing. And he says to you, the battle is not yours. It is his. You are fighting a fight that's not yours. It is God's to fight. But you need to just enter in and find, uh, find a place of worship and praise and give it to him. And recognize what he will do for you as you lift up his name. He will inhabit the praises of his people. Some of you need to stop fighting the fight and start worshiping God and let God do what only God can do. There's a, there's a well, I, I want to encourage you in this. Uh, find some good music that, that helps you, uh, background music or music with words or whatever, and the, you can get it on Spotify. You can, you can buy CDs. You can, you can get music. And even beyond that, whether you sing well or not, Lift your voice in praise to God. Do it when you're in the shower, when nobody's listening. Do it when you're driving in the car all by yourself. If you're bashful to sing, that's, I, 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 just, I do that. I love to worship God just when I'm by myself, but I love worshiping God when I'm with you as well. There's something about corporate worship, something special about that. Now, another story is Paul and Silas. They just had this incredible situation where they had cast out this, this demon out of a young lady who was telling the future. And the owners of this slave girl were making lots of money on the fact that she could tell the future. And they cast out the demons, and the owners of this girl didn't like what they had done because their way of making money was now gone. And so they, they caused this ruckus. 
In fact, they, they get Paul and Silas, and, and they actually are, are, are beating them and stuff, and then they, they put them into prison. Now, again, if that's you as a Christian, you're thinking, wow, I was doing God's work. In fact, we just had this demon leave this girl, and she's free now. God, is this how you treat me? Why am I here? They could have been in prison, and they could have been bitter and angry and mad at God. But what do they do? Verse 25, it's about midnight. Some of you have been sleeping, but these must, you know, they have the, the energy of a teenager yet. They're still awake at midnight. And Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison, it says, was shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. That's not normally how you fight a battle, but they entered into worshiping God, and God began to fight the battles for them. Since our God is still a God of big miracles, many of the times that you worship and praise him could completely turn the tide in your own personal trial, and all of a sudden, the miracle, the breakthrough that you are looking for begins to come after that time of worship and praising God. And again, many times the miracle, the breakthrough, actually comes in here. Most of the battles I face are not external. They're often internal. My thinking, my heart, my spirit. And when I begin to praise God, there's a switch that goes off, and I begin to change how I'm thinking. And God does a work in my heart. My situation may or may not change, but my attitude about it almost always does. But even beyond that, God can change your situation. As we take our eyes off the problem, now he may put them back on there to give you some tangible things led by the Spirit to do about the problem, but there's a time to take your eyes off the problem and take your eyes and put them on God and recognize who he is and what he can do in your behalf. This morning, in just a few moments, we're gonna have, again, an extended time of worship. It's still early. It's before 11, even. <laughs> and amazing. And this is on purpose. Because I want you to enter in, push aside the problems and what you're facing, and press into a God who knows all about it, and is able to do a miracle on your behalf a miracle on your behalf, and I'm believing for that. And, and we may, after a few songs, just praying and seeing how the spirits lead, I may have our prayer team just kind of go around and begin areas where you can go to them and be prayed for during this time. So we'll just see how the spirits lead. But worship team, I want you to come, if you would, please, this morning. In fact, really, <laughs> musicians come. We're all the worship team, all right? <laughs> Musicians are coming, we're on the team here this morning. And I'm going to invite you to stand with us this morning. Before we begin to sing and praise the Lord and worship, I want us to lead us, I want to lead us in prayer today. Many of you, you've got your list of the battles you're facing. It may be physical, relational things going on, financial, uh, just lost your job or job problems or whatever it is or issues at school, I don't know. But whatever it is that just you're thinking about, it's consuming you, you're wondering how's this gonna work out, those are the things I just want you to give over to God, to God and release them to you. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus my attention on you and you've promised you're gonna fight the battles for me. And just as I worship, I'm believing that in the spiritual realm, things are going to happen to reverse the situation I'm facing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as a congregation, we come before you in awe of your grace and your mercy of who you are, not just for what you've done. We've come to lift up the name of Jesus. There is no other name like his name. We come here this morning to bring you glory and honor, for that is why we have been created. And as we lift up the name of the Lord, we fulfill the number one reason why we exist. And Lord, we believe this morning in our midst, the problems we face will be changed. 
And certainly we pray that our attitude towards those things will be different. Lord, you are holy. You are worthy. There is no one like you. This morning we take our time to lift not just our voice and not just play these instruments, but to lift our heart in glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name. Can we just lift our voice and worship this morning? Oh, Jesus, we worship you. Come on, church, let's say it out loud. Let's shout unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We adore you, Jesus. We worship you, the King of kings. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you.
like us this morning to do something a little different. We've never really done this recently, but I can recall. But as Keith was talking about how the Israelite children, they bow before the Lord. Could we just do that today? Kneel or bow just before the Lord? I think that would just bring us to a brand new level of worship today. So very reverently, let's just bow before the Lord. Jesus, we bow before you today. We lower ourselves before the King of Kings, the Lord of all lords. We adore you, Jesus. You are our King, oh God. You are our mighty one. We worship you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, Father God, we worship you. We worship you, Jesus. You are our sustainer. You are our creator. Our Father God, our deliverer, our rescuer, our redeemer. You are our righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tomorrow morning, the sun's going to come up. And it's a new day. And it's a day that we have been created to praise and worship Him. So let's think about that. Let's allow our lives to bring Him glory and honor. Let's be vessels of worship to the Lord throughout this day. But tomorrow morning, again, when you wake up, let the first thing be that you lift up the name of the Lord. So again, if some of you have to leave, Lord bless you as you go. Have a great Lord's Day. Some of you... Just need to keep pressing in and letting the Lord set you free as his name is lifted up in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.